learning process. Some individuals are having a very difficult time, um, difficult time learning how to do this. Now, whether that has to do with having longer limbs, um, poor coordination, motor patterns, et cetera, um, it's also difficult to teach. So oftentimes we'll get some coaches out there that say, okay, you see that person doing a power clean over there? Go do that. Well, these movements are obviously a bit more complex than that. And as a result, um, if they're not taught properly, it's difficult for them to continue to use the movements effectively in their training, or I should say, get the most benefit out of them. So some of this comes down to incomplete triple extension. So they're shorting that pull or poor catching technique. So we'll think about that a little bit. So as you can see here with the athlete here on the left, um, we may have full extension of the ankles, the knees may are nearing extension, but you can also see that the hips aren't fully extended and the bar is actually out front a little bit. You may also see here with the, uh, with the pull, arms are bent prior to um, the actual pull itself. So athletes here may fail to maximally extend. Um, and part of this may be due to the fact that when we use heavier loads, they're focused on completing the lift. Well, how do you complete a catch? Derivative, you have to catch the bar. So if they're focused on more catching the bar rather than maximally extending, that may take away from the actual training stimulus that they're actually going to get. So what we've shown in some of our research um, that you may, with a pulling variation, get greater force impulse, rate of force development, et cetera, during a pull variation that focuses on maximal extension versus catching variations. In addition, there's another work, another piece of literature out there that has shown that greater work is performed with maximal effort cleans rather than minimal height. And if you recall, that minimal height is getting the bar to the minimal height you need to catch the bar. So when it comes to poor catching technique, um, they may not catch it in the proper position and that's going to modify the stimulus that they get. So all of us have seen athletes that do this, um, where we have a really high narrow catch. So the feet don't get to our squat stance. Um, we may catch it with low elbows, vertical forearms. And what that's gonna do is add negative stress to the wrist. So this is why some sports such as uh, baseball, softball, those throwing or overhead sports, don't like these movements because it's going to add additional stress to the wrists, the, the elbows, the shoulder, et cetera. Um, but we also have a small base of support here. This is going to limit squat depth. So we also may have what we call a starfish catch or a wide catch, where they may not be in the proper position for force acceptance. So what they may be doing here is compensating for a lack of mobility elsewhere. And I can tell you this particular individual is a, a quarterback in American football. And I can tell you that if they are in this position with low elbows, their vertical chest, and they're kind of leaning back here, they're getting knocked over. And whether that's rugby, and you can also make that argument as well. So what I do want to note, though, is that uh, a study was done in 1978. It was tracking two uh, national, international level weightlifters uh, that showed that they tracked injuries over a long period of time and showed that three of the top four injuries were the shoulder, the wrist, and the elbow um, when it comes to these movements. And something to note is that with catching variations, all of these joints in general on, are under a little greater stress compared to a pulling variation, simply because with a pull, you're, uh, you're simply shrugging the shoulders, the elbows may not bend all that much, and uh, the wrists aren't necessarily being put in, in a, an exaggerated extension position. Please note that one of these individuals was a junior world champion, and uh, so I would like to think that these individuals had pretty good technique <laughs> uh, when it came to tracking them over the course of this study. Uh, just for everyone's benefit, uh, the second most was the lower back. All right, now that brings us to pulling variation. So now we're eliminating that catch phase. So different examples, this is a counter movement shrug on the right. So what we're doing here is we're starting from a full uh, extended position. We're dropping to that power position or mid thigh position to extend. Now you're noticing that the bar doesn't 
isn't displaced that high. It's because he's using a load that's greater than 100% of his clean max. So some benefits here from the other movements that we, uh, from the other catching derivatives that we have, we still have coordinated triple extension. We still have postural strength adaptations. But what I do want to highlight is oftentimes people say with pulling variations that there is no load acceptance. You know, you're not going to accept a load. So that's why they say we have to catch. That's not necessarily true because if we perform a pull and the bar is being elevated, the bar just doesn't magically disappear. You know, the load is still in our hands. And as long as we bring it down in the proper position, we're getting load acceptance. Like uh, the legs still have, the muscles in the legs still have to activate. Our postural strength still has to be there. And if you, if we go back and actually look at our, um, our counter movement shrug, if I can get it to go again, He's bringing it down right where he pulled from, which is debatably the strongest position in a weightlifting movement. So there is still load acceptance here. Um, it is less complex regarding technique. We are omitting the catch phase. This, is, this can be used in a teaching progression of catching derivatives, and we'll talk about that later on. The other thing that some research, our research and others have shown is that with pulling derivatives, we can expand the loading potential and get max effort even at light loads. The reason why is we are using exercises that are more ballistic in nature, such as a jump shrug, a hang high pull, but we can also emphasize that force end of the spectrum like uh, with a counter movement shrug or with a clean pull from the floor in which we can use loads greater than our 1RM catching variation, whether it's a snatch or a clean variation. The benefits here are obviously greater force production. There are uh, limitations to these movements. And the primary one is that when we have team sport athletes who are used to performing catching variations, they may view pulls as quote unquote incomplete movements. They're they're saying, well, why do I go through you know, this, this half of a movement? Well, if we actually go through and watch um, maximal effort versus submaximal effort, we need to ensure that when people are, uh, when our athletes are performing poles, that they're putting in uh, forth the max effort here. So max effort here on the left, you see that full extension, really emphasizing punching into the ground, okay? But on here on the right, this is what some athletes will do when they're doing poles. Same load, but they won't finish the movement as much as they should. So here again is your max effort. All right, pulls from the floor. Here's your minimal effort. So a key take home when it comes to pulling variations, make sure that we coach our athletes to put in max effort, whether it is a catching variation or whether it is a pulling variation. Now, a uh, question I often get are, are there differences between catching and pulling? Uh, we've done a lot of research on this and it all started back with Paul Comfort in 2011. Um, what he ended up showing in his study is they looked at four different variations. It was a mid-thigh pull, a mid-thigh power clean, a hang clean, and a hang power clean. Uh, so what they ended up finding was that there were no differences between the mid-thigh pull and the mid-thigh power clean performed at the exact same load. Um, but however, if you compare those movements compared to the hang clean and hang power clean, they did produce greater force, rate of force development and power. So we expanded on this. This was part of my thesis work uh, where we took different variations, still kept the hang power clean, but we incorporated the jump shrug and the hang high pull. And what we ended up seeing was that the jump shrug and the hang high pull produced greater force velocity and power compared to the hang power clean. And part of this has to do with our hypothesis that individuals may not necessarily be maximizing their effort during a hang power clean. Now, if you see here, we did work up to 80%, so not exactly light. Now, Christoph Kipp followed up with this. We looked at joint power as well and saw very similar results. And most recently to K, uh, looked at the hang high pull compared to the hang power clean in weightlifters. So it's really interesting that we're seeing the same results kind of across the board with these more ballistic variations um, compared to uh, catching variations, even in team sport athletes, but also in weightlifters themselves who should have good technique. 
I will note with Takei's study, the heavier the load got, I believe he also looked at uh, 80%, 90, uh, and I think 95% as well. Um, the differences got smaller and smaller, and they weren't statistically different from each other. There may have been small effect sizes there uh, or practical significance. So uh, what you've seen up to this point is clean variations. Uh, Garrett Femster, who I advised during his thesis work, um, looked at the same exact loads with uh, snatch variations and saw similar results in terms of force production and slightly different results in terms of power. So one thing I will note here is that the jump shrug, or I should say all of these variations in terms of power output were calculated a different way. I used in my thesis work only the force plate data to get velocity, to get power, et cetera. A, uh, a linear position transducer was used for the barbell velocity and then was multiplied by force to get power in uh, Garrett's study. So um, we may go back and look at the force data to see if it tells us anything differently. Because as you can imagine with a snatch, you're going to have a very large uh, displacement of the bar versus a jump shrug, it won't be as large. So the other thing that we wanted to look at was not only just acute data or single data points, because prior to this, we looked at a thousand, or we were sampling at a thousand hertz. So if we had peak force, peak power, et cetera, it was one one thousandth of a second, whoop de doo right? So what we ended up doing in a couple of our studies is we looked at time normalized data to look at uh, force, impulse, rate of force development, power, work with the same exercises. Uh, and what you're looking at here is a solid line on here is the mean data uh, and the shaded area is the 95% confidence interval. So basically what I'm saying here is that if there's any white space between each of these variations, which is Clearly there is. Um, that is a statistical difference, but a very meaningful difference as well um, in, in this study anyway. So Christoph Kipp looked at something similar um, and found, and all of these studies basically went through and said that while all these movements are performed similarly, they start at the mid-thigh, bars lowered to the knee, transition back to the mid-thigh, and then the second pull is performed one of three ways. Um, with the hang power clean, with the high pull or the jump shrug. All those movements are very similar, about 80 to 85% of the entire movement. And as you can see in our graph over here, they aren't any different all the way up to that uh, 80%. But following that, when we actually get to the pull, how ballistic they are really starts to show up. Now with a jump shrug, you are cued to jump as high as possible off the ground. You're not cued to do that with a high pull or a hang power clean. And as a result, um, we're not totally surprised here by a greater power output. All right, now, again, all of this up to this point has been acute. One time we measured it and that's it. Well, we found essentially no differences with Paul Comfort's research, slight or differences in uh, the stimulus that we got in our research. So we wanted to see if these uh, results that we saw are going to translate when performed over a longer period of time. So the first study that uh, Paul Comfort and I collaborated on uh, this training study, eight weeks of training in season. And what we did here is we had a catch group and a pull group that uh, all of the lifts were performed at the exact same load. So if one group did a power clean from the floor, another group did a clean pull from the floor, uh, at 80 percent and what they what we ended up seeing with that is both groups improved their isometric mid thigh pull their counter movement jump performance but there weren't any statistical or practical differences between the groups and that was for peak force rate of force development um, our jump height power etc now if you look at uh, just this data here Isometric relative peak force, so that is our second pull position. What we saw is that both groups improved the amount of uh, force that they're putting into the ground. So the take home message from this study isn't that one is better than the other. In fact, it's, it says completely the opposite. It, what it is saying is that you can perform the exact same exercises, at, or sorry, different exercises at the exact same load and still get the same result. So whether it's catching, whether it's pulling, 
what this is doing is offering us more options. Now, this is what I like to term the gray area. So this is from a 2017 paper uh, that we put together in uh, Strength and Conditioning Journal. And what this is illustrating is that the gray area here represents an area that it really doesn't matter what exercise you are performing, but it does matter what load you are using. So I could perform something like a hang high pull with a heavier load and generate the same power output as a hang power clean at that heavier load and still get the same power output or, uh, or the same result. So we wanted to put this uh, into, or we wanted to put this into study a little bit farther as well, because as I mentioned previously with our force velocity curve here, we have the ability to provide a velocity overload stimulus with something like a jump shrug, but we also have the ability to use a force overload stimulus with something like a pull from the floor. So if we take this into consideration, there are phase specific demands of each phase that we need to meet. So whether it's a strength phase, a, a strength endurance phase, a strength power phase, et cetera, uh, we wanted to program the exercises that way. So in our follow-up studies, uh, we did two, we're working, uh, working on writing up the, uh, the other data that we have. We did 10 weeks of training. Uh, the first three weeks were three sets of 10. Now I know what you're thinking, 10, 10 repetitions of a weightlifting movement. Uh, yes, we did do that. However, we did break them down into cluster sets. So every single time uh, an individual performed a weightlifting derivative in this phase, it was performed with 10 reps total. But what they did was uh, a set of five, rest 30, 30 to 40 seconds, and then performed another set of five. The following four weeks were uh, a strength phase or a general strength phase, three sets of five. Week eight was an overreach, and then a taper uh, was performed in, in three, uh, three sets of three, three sets of two. Now, in this study, we matched the same groups that Comfort did in the other study, where we had the catching and pulling variations performed at the exact same loads, uh, just like the first study, but we also added a third group, which was our what we call our overload group. They only performed pulling variations, but they used phase-specific loading to provide either a force or velocity overload stimulus. For example, um, during a strength phase, the catch group may have been performing a mid-thigh power clean. The pull group would be performing a mid-thigh pull at the exact same load. But our overload group would also be performing a mid-thigh pull, but much, much heavier. Uh, it, we, out, we went up to 135% of 1RM uh, with a mid-thigh pull in the strength phase. Now, what did we find? Well, the first study that we put together, we looked at a variety of things. We looked at uh, 1RM power clean. We looked at, and that was pre and post, we looked at iso pull relative strength, sprints, change direction. And what we ended up finding, interestingly enough, is that with a power clean, we saw the greatest benefits with an overload group that didn't catch for 10 weeks. We also saw slightly greater benefits on average with the pull group that didn't catch for 10 weeks. Now, I will also say that all of these exercises, all of our weightlifting exercises were also performed in a training program that included squats, uh, pulling, or pulling variations such as our bent over row, RDLs, blah, 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 what have you but there were no front squats in them. So the pull and overload group wasn't in the front rack position for 10 weeks. And on average, the overload group improved their 1RM power clean almost 8%. Uh, now, the other thing that was interesting is these results translated to everything else that we looked at. ISO pull peak force, the 10, 20, and 30 meter sprint, and the 505 on both sides display the greatest benefits from the overload group. So what does this tell us? It tells us that if we use phase specific loading with pulls, we're able to produce a greater benefit compared to only performing sub-maximal catching or pulling variations. Now in our second study, we uh, looked into our jumps a little bit more. We looked at our height, propulsion mean force, propulsion time, 
what we ended up showing here is that the overload group again produced greater squat jump propulsive force compared to the pull group. So we also have, so this is a pre and post. Um, you can see that there's greater force production with the overload group earlier in that normalized curve. Uh, what we also saw, and I'll break this down in a second, is that there were greater braking forces uh, with the overload group compared to the catch group. So I'll come back to that. Uh, now, this is where some of you may be questioning, well, you haven't looked at the, the load acceptance yet. Well, if we look at um, our load acceptance acute studies, what we end up seeing is similar results where with a jump shrug and a high pull, we ended up with greater work being performed during the load acceptance phase that is following the second pull compared to a hang power claim. Now, something to note though, is that each of the variations that we looked at in this first study produced force differently during the load acceptance phase. So with a jump shrug, you have to land. Otherwise, you're not completing the movement. If you fall over, that's a problem. Put it on YouTube, but um, if you're doing a jump shrug, you have to land and land um, safely with a bar in your hands. So what we saw with the jump shrug is that there was high force over a short period of time during the uh, load acceptance phase. The high pull was low force over a long duration, and the hang power clean was moderate force over a moderate duration. So what we're seeing here is a spectrum of load acceptance. And, and again, it's not one or the other. It is what are you training for and when do you need to train for it? If you need rapid load acceptance, you might need to use something like a jumping variation or a jump shrug in this instance. If uh, you're farther away and you don't need, um, you want work performed, but you don't need to have it as, as uh, rapid, you may want something like a high pull and a hang power clean can mix in there uh, in between as well. Um, Comfort showed this with a pull from the knee and a, hang, um, and a hang power clean, no difference between a pull from the knee and a hang clean. We also showed this also again in the joints. So getting back to the training study, um, what I, again, what I wanted to show you was the pre and post of the overload and the catch. Now, it is argued that a, uh, a weightlifting catching variation is going to produce that rapid load acceptance. Well, if you look at the force time curve of this, uh, and if we trace this through, I don't know if you can, no, we can't see a mouse on here anyway, but um, you can see the counter movement being performed in the counter movement jump, but that first peak that you see on the bottom graph is our max breaking force, meaning we are stopping our body. So what we end up seeing here is that we had greater force production during the eccentric or breaking phase during an overload where they didn't perform a catch phase. So again, can you get the same benefits or greater benefits uh, to a breaking force or any, or any other sprint, et cetera? You can, as long as it is loaded uh, with a phase specific purpose. Now, I will note um, with catching and pulling variations that the load acceptance is going to vary based on how the technique is performed. So a less experienced individual may what we call over pull the bar. So if you watch this video on the top left, he's going to what we call loop the bar up and it's going to come down and crash on top of him. I'll play that one more time. Bar comes up, comes down, crashes on top of him. Now, what you may also see is that more experienced individuals are going to decrease the downward displacement of the bar and meet it at its max height. So this video that was performed before or shown before, and if you were to uh, go through and track the bar here, you're gonna see peak bar height to where the bar is caught is much smaller compared to letting the bar be over pulled and come down and crash on top of you. Now with pulling variations, we're trying to maximize bar height. And what this may also do is increase the downward displacement. So this is a hang high pull. We're trying to maximize bar height. I'll play that one more time. Down and up. And what we see here if we track bar height is we're seeing a much larger displacement of the bar, meaning it is going to have a greater influence with gravity um, which is going to influence how much uh, work needs to be performed uh, when it comes down. 
but we can also do this with really heavy loads. So this is a clean pull from the floor. So again, because we are maximizing bar height, we can also still see that a max, uh, max effort pull can still create a fairly large displacement compared to a catching variation. The take home message here is that as individuals get better with their catch, they're going to meet the bar at, a, um, at its peak height, meaning um, the, the actual stimulus of the catch gets smaller and smaller, the better an individual gets with the lift. So when it comes to kind of this programming, I mentioned that we have this gray area. So revisiting this, there's a time and a place for all of these variations if you choose to incorporate them. Remember, just because our research may show that pulling variations may produce greater sprint performance here or, or uh, whatever, that doesn't mean I'm saying, don't ever do catching variations. If you go through and read our literature, we never say that, although people, some people want me to be saying that in the research. Just know that we are trying to add tools to a coaching toolbox, not take things away. So uh, what we'll also see here is that if you're tracking something like barbell velocity, this is a project that we're working on now, is that the exercise and load combinations may train specific characteristics. So if we look at peak barbell velocity, this was all collected with a gym aware, is you start to see different zones start to show up and different exercises falling into that velocity. So if you see between 1.6 and 2 meters per second, you end up seeing four different exercises, four different exercises show up that you can incorporate and potentially get the exact same benefit. So again, it's not one or the other. It is what exercise is the individual competent in performing and where are they going to give max effort depending on the goals that you are trying to train at the time. I also want to mention that this gray area can also show up with different variations. So this study or uh, this group of studies that we have here is comparing the jump squat, the hex bar jump, and a jump shrug. So in general, in both men and women, the hex bar and the jump shrug produce greater power output compared to a jump squat. Um, but we also showed that the jump shrug produced greater force at peak power but a uh, slower velocity at peak power compared to uh, the hex jump and the jump squat. Now, what again, what does this mean? Is it one or the other? No, it is what are you training at the time? We may want to use a jump shrug, as looking at the profiles here, we may want to use a jump shrug at lighter loads because that's where it's going to maximize power output. And because it has a hip hinge movement, whether you're weaker or stronger, at heavier loads, that hip hinge movement is harder to perform. All of these were performed with percentages of body weight. So we went 0, 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100% of their body weight uh, with all of these. But you can see that both a hex jump and a jump squat, you can maintain that technique a little bit better compared to heavier loads with a hip hinge movement. I also want everyone to consider that with load acceptance, the way that we perform something like a push press or a jerk may also modify that uh, rack position. So watching the push press here on, on the left, this is kind of a hybrid approach where you're dropping under the bar, but you're also cushioning it a little bit on the way down. Now we can modify that and we can just let the bar free fall on, the top, on top of us. Now notice, that because of this larger displacement, the bar is generating higher velocity coming down and it's going to um, kind of crash on us a little bit more. Now you could also perform this movement and slowly lower it the entire time, but the demands of performing each of these variations is going to be slightly different. But again, if we go and compare this to a catch position in a clean, the displacement is going to be significantly larger, especially if we allow it to free fall. So if people say the only way to get stronger in that front rack position, or I should say generate rapid force production is with a clean catch, I would 
argue against that and say that something like a push press or a jerk, assuming you bring the bar down and catch it, will probably give you a similar, if not greater, stimulus. We also have to consider this eccentric uh, training spectrum. We have slow velocity movements, rapid velocity, and our weightlifting movements and derivatives are going to vary on that loading spectrum, whether you're performing catching or pulling variations. We also have to consider that things like AEL and flywheel training are also going to be on the spectrum. I bring this up with weightlifting movements since they're often touted as a, uh, a way to generate that eccentric or braking force. Just remember that because there's slow velocity movements, there's rapid velocity movements, there are different ways that we can achieve a training stimulus. And uh, what we also have to consider is the other movements that we are performing in tandem with our weightlifting movements. So the other thing I'll note is that movement on the spectrum may be modified based on the exercise, the load, the technique. Um, everyone has seen an individual uh, perform a poor clean before where they start fish out, they're forearms are vertical, they're basically leaning backwards and uh, performing some sort of Michael Jackson move I've never seen before, but um, not necessarily in a safe position. So the way that we get these eccentric or breaking training benefits is uh, one with good technique, but also how we modify the exercise and load for the individual. Now, when it comes to programming these uh, these weightlifting movements, what we have to consider is what is our goal of the training phase. So if we have strength endurance, typically what we're focused on is uh, a higher volume of training. A lot of people think of this phase as a hypertrophy phase. Uh, strength endurance simply refers to the fact that we are trying to perform more work or prepare the body to perform more work. We may also increase our muscle cross-sectional area during this time. Uh, with strength phases, we're trying to increase the amount of force production and rate of force development. And then with our strength speed and speed strength, we're trying to peak these abilities of both rate of force development and power. But what I will note is that as we continue to add exercises in here, you're going to see pulling variations on the top and catching variations on the bottom in italics. Um, the purpose here is that you may want to perform more simplistic movements when you have a higher training volume, uh, that is the pulling variations, and then as the volume starts to drop, then you can start to incorporate these catching variations, the hang power clean, power clean, snatch, etc. cetera, um, because technique starts to break down really fast when you're performing catching variations. And in fact, we have some literature that hasn't been published yet, or a research that hasn't been published yet, that you can perform up to 10 plus mid thigh pulls in a row and your technique doesn't change based on kinematic and force production data. So what I will note here is that also choosing the exercise that's going to benefit these characteristics to the greatest extent. Um, as we get towards a strength speed and speed strength, we're focused on performing movements that are going to be fast, ballistic in nature. We want max rate of force development, power output, et cetera. But with our max strength phases, we may want to perform exercises that are going to use heavier loads. So we have our counter movement shrugs, we have our mid thigh pull, pull from the floor, pull from the knee. The bar may not be displaced all that much, but when we have max effort put into the pull itself, we're generating a lot of force production and we're doing it rapidly. So we can also consider this for speed development. So we have our same training goals, but across the way, we also have our different phases of speed development, acceleration, transition, uh, and these often coincide with our different training phases. So if we look at a strength endurance phase, we have high volume in the weight room. Um, because, we're, because we're fatigued from that, we also have to consider um, with our athletes, we're probably developing some accelerative ability during this, perhaps performing incline sprints at the time, um, but the force production isn't going to be as rapid because we are at a point where we can't generate that amount or that rapid force production because of the fatigue. Now, as you go through this, uh, if we think about an acceleration, we may have 
um, a three-point stance or out of the starting blocks. There's been some research out there that has shown that weightlifting derivatives that start from the floor mimic these angles. Uh, in fact, and or as a result of that, we may want to consider movements that are going to be foundational in nature. So movements that are going to lay the foundation for other movements we may perform later. Um, but again, during a strength endurance phase, we have to think about the technique of something like catching derivatives when technique starts to break down. Uh, now, I'd also like to provide the position and movement sequence because um, that's going to play into this as well. So if this is a three-point stance, I want everyone to look at the angles that are being, um, being produced right here on the first left picture. And then as we transition, we have our uh, right leg crossing behind. Uh, notice that position there. Now, if, this if sprinting uh, acceleration was truly a horizontal movement, which it is not, um, it would be in this position. However, if we rotate this individual to vertical, I think you know where I'm going with this, but you can see that the individual in terms of this force production may be horizontal to the ground, but vertical relative to the athlete. So we also need to consider what um, our movement sequence is where we have that front shin. Notice that it translates forward from where it was originally. Now, if we take a clean pull from the floor, we have our starting position. We're going to transition to the knee during the first pull, and then we're going to get to our upright power position where we're uh, scooping back under the bar. Very similar movement and movement sequence compared to an acceleration from a three-point stance or out of the blocks. Now, with the transition phase, it is important to note that the, um, that the amount of knee flexion and extension um, starts to become smaller. And what I mean by that is we may not get to full extension. Um, we talk about the triple extension movement and training that movement, but we should note that it is all about the effort that's put forth into the ground. And when we have weightlifting movements where we are punching the ground as a cue, um, we have to consider what force we're producing and how quickly we are producing that force. We also have to consider the position of the athlete. With a transition, we are moving from a forward lean position to an upright position. So also recall that because this takes place during a, max, a maximal and absolute strength phase, we're looking for high force production and we're trying to develop that rate of force development. So with our high force production, we may use heavier loads that are going to be movement specific. I have this in slow-mo, but this is a pull from, uh, pull from the knee in the upper left. So you can see that the individual is transitioning to an upright position, which is exactly what we're doing during a transition phase. Now with uh, the rate of force development component, we may use slightly light, uh, lighter loads focused on a faster velocity that are still movement specific. Because acceleration is the foundation of our sprint, we need to be able to continue to incorporate those types of movements. So again, we're coming from a, um, a bent over position and transitioning to an upright position when we pull. Now with our max velocity, notice that our knee angle, we are vertical in our torso. Um, we have a short ground contact time and we need high magnitudes of force and rate of force development. This is where our power is going to be generated. So if we look at um, the best way to produce power, there is some research out there, great paper by Hoff and Nymphius in 2012 that looked at training that force velocity spectrum and kind of what we looked at in our training study. So strength speed, we wanna move heavier loads quickly. That may be our counter movement shrug as we looked at before. But notice when we perform these movements, we have angle specificity when it comes to the angles that they're getting to. And in fact, that mid thigh position, when you look at it from a mid thigh pull perspective, uh, we're looking at angles generally between 120 and 135 um, when they get there. So also, with our speed strength, now we're moving light loads quickly, meant to be ballistic. Sprinting is ballistic, so if we use something like a jump shrug, we're trying to be as fast as possible, so we're using a lighter load on this end of the spectrum. Now, 
because force times velocity is power, we also have to consider using both exercises to emphasize both the strength side and the speed side. But we also have to consider that load absorption or load acceptance component um, because something like a, a jump shrug may allow us to rapidly produce force production or rapidly produce force during that load acceptance phase. And if you read the literature when it comes to sprinting, we may be accepting as much as five times our body weight on a single leg when, we're, um, when we are coming down during a sprint or during our swing phase. Now, how do we program these? Uh, you know, we've gone through uh, different ways to, or different literature that's out there. We talked about the theory. Well, what about the application? Well, first and foremost, what I would suggest is that we use, uh, especially with novices, pulling derivatives as the primary training stimulus as athletes learn how to perform the catch. So this focuses on the pull. What I tell my students and my athletes, if the pull sucks, everything else is gonna suck too. So, but during this time, even between sets, we can incorporate some of these catching drills, a muscle plane, rack delivery, tall plane and snatch, just to get used to uh, turning over the bar. And then also during this time, they may be performing overhead squats, they may be performing front squats to get used to having the bar in that position, but also developing strength in those positions. Um, this is from a paper recently, um, this is kind of the progression that we use. We can go from the floor uh, or a floor progression, a hang progression, but all moving towards our catches if we choose to do so. Now, when I teach my athletes how to perform weightlifting movements, we usually start at the mid thigh, which is where the second pull starts from, and then gradually work our way either down to the floor or during a hang uh, or within a hang position, depending on where we are in our training. Um, seems to be successful for us, and I can tell you that a number of our athletes, we sp simply stick with poles because we don't need to turn over the bar necessarily. Now, if you want to incorporate that catch, uh, how we can do it in training is we can start with things as, uh, like complexes. We may do a pull from the floor as our foundational movement moving to a hang power clean and then front squatting. What that's, do, what that's doing is breaking down a clean into different pieces uh, from the floor. So if we wanted to perform a hang, or sorry, a power clean from the floor, we can do that. If we want to perform a full clean eventually, we can do that because we're working on those pieces. But then we can start to incorporate um, our pulls from the floor as our primary, um, as our primary training stimulus within our working set, and then use a drop set with a power clean as we get used to turning over the bar. We're gonna drop the weight, we're gonna make it faster and allow that individual to use a lighter submaximal load. But then we can do something called between set complexes where we are alternating um, the exercise that we are performing. Something like a clean pull, going to a power clean, back to a clean pull, and then a drop set with a power clean. So you can see the variation not only in loading, but also in exercise. Eventually, we're getting towards using our catching variations as our complete sets and as our primary training stimulus. But here, what I want to emphasize is we are using our pulls as our foundational movements to get to catches if we choose to do so. Some other programming examples I wanted to run through, and this is very similar to the training study that we, uh, that we used. Notice that uh, we still incorporate our squats, we still incorporate our, um, our, our pulls and, and whatnot. This is uh, again, implementing catching and pulling variations. What I would recommend again with those uh, higher volume sets is that we're using cluster sets and you can see the differences between the beginner, the intermediate and advanced in terms of how heavy we're actually going with these loads. One thing I would also emphasize is the way that we program is that uh, day one is kind of our jerk progression day, day two is our clean progression day, and day three is our snatch progression day. Uh, the whole purpose there is we're emphasizing um, very forceful and uh, fast movements at the beginning. We still have a fast movement at the end of the week with a snatch variation, but it's going to be using a lighter load, relatively speaking, or absolutely speaking, compared to a clean. 
Now, when we get to a strength phase, now we can start to emphasize those movements um, that have smaller displacements, but we can start to incorporate um, heavier movements as well. Notice that with the beginner, we're not necessarily going to be performing two uh, derivatives, but we are gonna be using a progression exercise, something like a clean deadlift before we get to a clean grip pull from the floor. Um, notice that the intermediate is using very heavy loads or high, heavy to very heavy loads versus an advanced athlete maybe using super maximal loads. And you can see this with both a clean and a snatch as well. When we get to an even lower volume, now we're starting to incorporate that rate of force development component, but please note that the loading spectrum is going to be all over the place here, depending on the training age of the individual. So we have light to moderate loads with certain exercises, moderate to moderately heavy, super maximal loads, what have you. Uh, notice that uh, we are still not catching with the beginners yet, but we are starting to get them to a point where they're ready to turn over the bar. They're performing pulls from the floor with uh, moderate to moderately heavy loads, and we're using lighter loads to help them elevate the bar and get used to that uh, high pull position. But also notice with an intermediate individual and advanced, now we're incorporating a combination of both catching and pulling variations, which will allow us to develop um, their ability to turn over the bar as well. When we get to kind of those taper phases, um, now you can see that we incorporate with a beginner a mid-thigh power clean. They're ready to turn over the bar now. They have a very strong foundation of not only their squats, um, and their uh, derivatives in there with their stiff leg deadlifts, et cetera. But they've now had the practice in, with our um, drills that they're able to turn over the bar effectively, but also use it for the training stimulus that's going to be unique. Here, we're focused on peak rate of force development and power output. So you can see that all of them are, all the athletes are incorporating jump shrugs, which are really fast, but we also have a snatch grip high pull that's also very fast. So a couple notes that I wanted to give you kind of as we wrap things up here, we're working on a study right now to be able to prescribe pulls based on um, something other than the 1RM of a catch. Some individuals, they, they uh, may see some of our literature and say, well, I don't wanna do a catch and that's fine. Um, if you do a catch, you can use it, um, use the 1RM or percentages of the 1RM. That's what most of the literature is based on now. Um, there was a recent study that uses percentages of body weight. But um, the problem with a pull, trying to do a, a quote unquote 1RM with a pull, is you end up with people in positions like this. Um, now, I don't know if this individual is sprouting wings or what's going on here. It looks like they're going to hit themselves in the throat with a bar. But uh, if this is considered a high pull 1RM, um, they are elevating the barbell to their chest height by dropping down to the bar. So this isn't something that we want to necessarily uh, incorporate with our athletes. So we're looking for alternative methods. And one of those ways that we can do that is using what we call set rep best. Set rep best uses the actual loads in training that we have used for each exercise and estimates a 1RM based on what we've performed. This may work best with uh, what we consider force dominant derivatives, our mid thigh pull counter movement shrug, because the load is going to be continually increased with those heavier loads because they're focused on developing more force. Another way that we can use this possibly is again, percentages of body mass or back squat 1RM. Um, this is probably gonna work better with our velocity dominant movements. And this optimal load range that we typically talk about is going to be based on our relative strength level. So you can see what we're seeing in some of our, um, our preliminary data right now that uh, you can still see the hang clean pull and counter movement shrug are going to be over 100% of body mass for peak power output. It really just depends uh, on the individual. And uh, as I mentioned previously, I showed the data earlier, but uh, individuals may use velocity uh, or VBT to track these movements, and you may be able to incorporate that as a method to um, train a specific zone um, rather than using percentages of 1RM. So as we wrap this up, um, it's very clear that both weightlifting, catching, and pulling variations are going to be 
effective training exercises, whether we incorporate catching, pulling, um, or whatever combination. But really what it's going to come down to is that if we use phase-specific loading or phase-specific goals to guide our loading with these exercises and exercise choices, it's going to give us a better training effect compared to just using one or the other only with submaximal loading. There's a way, um, you know, the common phrase is there's many ways to skin a cat. Well, the cat still needs to be skinned. And I know my wife hates me saying that because we have a cat now, but there's a lot of different ways to accomplish the exact same goal. Um, notice that the training phases of resistance training and speed may line up with each other. So we may be able to incorporate the movements with a greater purpose beyond just how much can we lift. Um, but just note that weightlifting and derivatives are tools that we need to use within a holistic program. It's not, um, you know, are we only going to do weightlifting movements? Or are we going to do jumping movements? Well, I'm willing to bet you're probably going to squat. You may deadlift, you may bench press, you may do bent over rows or what have you. Just, in, just understand the fact that the amount of fatigue that is going to be produced with different exercises and different phases is going to be unique to those uh, exercises. But we should always incorporate other methods um, with our weightlifting movements to achieve the adaptations that we're trying to get in each phase. Um, but again, the overall training stress is something that we have to consider when combining a variety of methods. So with that, um, I want to thank everyone for the um, opportunity and the, the attention at IUSCA um, for this opportunity. And at this time, um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them over the microphone or if you want to type them into the q and I'll come back and um, finish those up before heading out. But uh, thank you again, and uh, I appreciate it. So I'll go into go into the Q and A, um, answer a couple of these questions. Um, Luke uh, Luke asked, "Have you done any research comparing this to jumps with barbell or hex bar?" <laughs> um, you may have asked this question before we got to that slide, but uh, yes, we um, with men and women, uh, we have done uh, now a couple studies with looking at the jump shrug the hex bar jump and the jump squat. It was uh, the whole purpose of that study was to look at the effect of load placement. Um, and uh, as a result, um, we found those differences. And uh, something else that we would like to compare in the future is, com and is comparing um, other weightlifting variations with jumps. Um, something to note um, is we chose the jump shrug with those other variations. One, because it's a jumping movement, but also um, it generated the highest power outputs, relatively speaking, compared to all the other derivatives that we looked at. So we wanted to see the, um, the highest uh, power output compared to high power outputs with those jump variations as well. So I hope um, that answered your question. Um, and uh, if I didn't, please follow up and I'm happy to, um, happy to um, answer it further. Um, how would you recommend finding the balance between catching and pulling? You did speak about that gray area. I just want to clarify. Um, no, very good question. Um, honestly, uh, I place, this is just my training philosophy. We place a larger emphasis on the poles. Um, oftentimes when we have uh, younger athletes coming in, whether they have a lot of training experience or uh, a little training experience, it's always nice to revisit those. They're simpler. Um, and as long as we're maximizing the effort during the pulls, we usually emphasize that. However, um, we get to a point with some athletes that they just need something new. And using a catching variation, we can certainly um, we can certainly add a kind of that novel training stimulus by turning over the bar. And the way that you saw um, uh, we in, how we incorporate those in those last several phases we that's what we uh, that's how we program um we incorporate them uh, the uh, emphasize the pulls earlier in the training cycle and then when we get to kind of that 
uh, absolute strength phase where we're focused on rate of force development as well, we start to incorporate a combo of both pulls and catches as long as we're emphasizing um, as long as we're emphasizing or training the goal that we're trying to get to. Uh, <clears throat> David, question, um, have you looked at uh, SL variations of weightlifting derivatives at all? Um, SL. Um, oh, there we go. Thank you, David. I appreciate it. Uh, single leg variations. No, I have not looked at single leg variations of derivatives. And um, quite honestly, I'm not a huge fan of them. The, the reason why is I don't like the instability of it. Um, and I would also argue that if we're using single leg um, variations, we kind of have to emphasize more of the jumping components to the movements because we need to generate more force in order to be into that position. And in that case, if we're just trying to be fast with a single leg, oftentimes I'll incorporate plyo variations that are single leg, whether it's bounding, whether it's um, uh, some box jumps, what have you. Uh, I don't, I don't mind um, incorporating plyos. They're not one of, uh, not one of our mainstays, but again, as we get with our athletes, we start to incorporate faster uh, variations and our plyos certainly um, uh, are involved with that as well. Uh, could you please give us your articles related to this webinar? Um, so fun fact, uh, let me go back and actually share that screen for you. Um, this screen on here, if you look at uh, ResearchGate down there, um, that ResearchGate has, I believe, all of our articles that have um, been, been published on our weightlifting stuff. So you can find everything that I talked about in this study um, at that website, not to self-plug, but that's where um, all of that literature is housed. So you can see all of that literature um, at my ResearchGate page. Um, you just have to go into, once you get there, there's a research items tab. You can click on that and just go through the, um, the literature there. But thank you for the question. Uh, have you done research comparing split variation with dumbbells on the performance of team sport players such as basketball and volleyball? Um, split variations, I'm assuming that you're referring, oh, okay, catch, yeah, catch variations. Um, there's really not a lot of literature on there, uh, out there on it. Um, I, I know that when I first learned how to do a snatch, um, I believe I learned it, or I, I should say a power snatch, but then some people started incorporating a split to it, so I've done that as well. Um, I have not done any research with it, uh, with dumbbells. Um, I haven't done any research with splits compared to traditional or more traditional weightlifting movements, so i sorry I can't really provide any insight on that. Um, now, if we're focused on the force production being vertical force production with splits just in the catch, um, you can still generate a lot of force output because you're still going through your, um, your sequence of movements with your first pull, second pull. Um, it would be interesting to see more literature on it. Um, I don't have any plans personally to, to look at those things, but uh, certainly like a thesis or a dissertation for somebody. Um, Okay, uh, longer one here. Um, don't you think that load acceptance arrows path um, should be smaller? My point is bar load has inertia, not accepting it until the bar touches the shoulders. Um, power position, the bar is fr uh, freely falling. Yeah, um, Amit, honestly, I apologize if I butchered your name, by the way. Um, there's certainly more, I'm looking at this right now at face value. It's very difficult to study that, uh, that portion of the movement, um, given the fact that yes, uh, the, we're still accepting the force um, as the bar certainly comes down. It has some inertia um, and we have to stop it. What you saw in those pictures was the lowest position of the catch. Um, Hang on, no, it wasn't the lowest position of the catch. So you are right in the fact that um, the downward movement, um, the downward movement of whether it's a push press, whether it's a clean, whether it's a snatch, certainly has to be incorporated with the work that's being performed during the load acceptance phase, 100%. Um, 
and uh, more research needs to be done on that. In fact, one of our sponsors, Output, I know I talked to them um, about uh, if we could get the device to measure something like that. I know that's something that I want to uh, delve into more in terms of the research. So I appreciate the question. Um, I certainly think that there's uh, more questions than answers when it comes to that. And again, we're just kind of talking about this in theory. Um, my primary argument right now is that as the bar has a longer uh, displacement or larger displacement, there's going to be more downward inertia of it. Um, and uh, talking with Mike Stone, um, you know, he kind of agrees with that concept as well. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the question that I, I try to answer with this is that if, if, our, only, if our only purpose gets to be, you know, if we, if people say, well, poles are going to be greater than catches in terms of the pole, blah, blah, blah. And then we get to the fact where we're saying, well, we still, we have to get the catch in order to do this. If we're only relying on the catch, are we really giving the best benefit to our athletes for that eccentric uh, force production? Um, and again, I'm in favor of all the weightlifting movements. Um, I'm just looking at this from a, both a practitioner and a scientist standpoint that there are uh, a number of considerations that we have to have when it comes to that bar in that kind of free fall, if you will. So hopefully I answered that. Happy to talk about it um, more after this as well. Uh, how long would you recommend spending on teaching of the lifts to a soccer team? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, I work with a sport with volleyball that um, we don't, um, we actually don't incorporate um, catching variations with them at all. So we spend, um, each time they come back from a long break, in, in our case, they're off for summer, they're off for winter. When they come back, we kind of return to the foundation of that. We spend a solid probably uh, two weeks um, when they get back, whether they're novices or whether they are, uh, or whether they've been here for a few years, um, we spend those couple weeks just working on technique. And it's not just with the, uh, the derivatives, we are focused on all the movements in terms of technique, our squat variations, uh, bench press, incline press, bent over row, we go through all of that primarily just to give them a new foundation to work from. As much as we would like to, um, as much as we would like to uh, say that our athletes do everything that we want them to do in their breaks, um, unfortunately, they do not, um, you know, not all the time. So I just, I work on the assumption that nobody did anything so I can start everyone at the same, um, same spot. Now, if they did do a lot and it's quite obvious, I'll let them progress a little bit faster. But um, I'll tell you some of the derivatives that we've used, um, like a jump shrug, I taught the jump shrug to our volleyball uh, our volleyball athletes in one uh, one day, and it took ten minutes, not even ten minutes. Um, demo the movement. They've already been doing our um, our hand clean pulls, and they've been doing RDL, so they understood the hip hinge movement. And volleyball players know how to jump. Um, so, how long would I spend with the soccer team? I hate to give you the scientific answer of it depends, but it kind of does um, because we have individuals that move really well. We also have individuals that don't move very well. So it's, uh, it's all going to be on an individual basis. But uh, with my athletes, I usually incorporate um, at least a solid two weeks of going through the pulls and then incorporating those catching drills throughout the, uh, throughout the training year. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's, um, the derivatives of the uprising of Franz Bosch with rise to drawer and which part of the profile would you put them? Um, I believe what you're asking is, would I put them in kind of the force um, end of the spectrum or the velocity end of the spectrum? Uh, Cristobal, if I, um, if, I am in, if I am interpreting that correctly. Um, I would, and again, I hate to say it depends, but it really does because we may have an exercise that like a jump shrug. A jump shrug is certainly a velocity dominant movement and to get the most out of that movement, we're going to use it with really light loads. So in that aspect, it can be velocity dominant. However, 
Uh, we have our movements that are going to be force dominant, where we're using loads upwards to 140% in something like a mid-thigh pull counter movement shrug. Um, now, compared to other exercises, um, compared to sprinting, they're slow. It's very obvious that uh, weightlifting movements are very slow, and it sounds weird to say that, slow compared to uh, things like sprints and jumps. But that's why we need to incorporate a variety of exercises to work that entire force velocity uh, curve, if you will. Um, and I could be wrong, but um, if those are, who are part of NSCA TV, um, I know that they have, um, they may have that as an open talk um, that I did a couple years ago on that. But um, I would certainly say that in general, um, weightlifting movements kind of fall in the middle of everything. Uh, because they won't produce as much force compared to eccentric um, variations um, from an eccentric standpoint of the curve. Isometrically, um, they may not incorporate or produce as much force, but we may also have the fact that they may not produce as much velocity as faster movements such as jumping and sprinting. So again, they kind of fall in the middle, but it's going to be dependent on loading. Uh, okay, I have uh, Callum, thank you for the question. Um, I've recently been experimenting with hang pulls and jump shrugs to manipulate magnitude and rate of eccentric hamstring loading to help bridge the gap from the gym to return to sprinting following a hamstring injury. Um, I would be interested to hear your opinion on this topic. I'm not too aware of much research surrounding this. Um, you and me both, <laughs> unfortunately, there's not a ton of literature um, again, on the eccentric side of these, um, of these exercises. Now, um, I will say that uh, with the project that we're working on currently, uh, the Loading Alternatives Project, we are also collecting force plate data. So we uh, force plate data and um, uh, barbell velocity data. So hopefully we'll be able to contribute to that literature a little bit more, Callum. Um, I think you're on the right track. Uh, we obviously need to have a high rate of eccentric force production, especially when it comes to those hamstring injuries, because frankly, there's way too many hamstring injuries. Um, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say that I can give you an answer uh, to any of this right now, but I think you're on the right track of incorporating a combination of not only force production but uh, rate of force production with those exercises. So I'd certainly say you're on the right track. Um, I would also say incorporating exercises that are going to be more eccentric in nature, um, whether it's starting with tempo um, movements that are a bit slower uh, to generate that force production or working to uh, get that high eccentric rate of force development with AEL, um, that may be beneficial as well. So more and more research coming out on that and more coming from our lab as well. Uh, when you are using pulling derivatives as a teaching technique, do you prefer teaching top to bottom or bottom to top? Um, which do you find more successful, uh, the athlete for later training phases? Um, thank you, Haley. Um, hope you're doing well. Um, I like to say that I kind of teach things from the middle. Um, it, it really depends on the lingo that you have with individuals. If, you if you're looking at something like... Um, uh, weightlifting federations, they're going to typically talk about the top being um, that mid-thigh position um, versus the bottom is the floor position. Um, I like to start at the mid-thigh position because that's where the pull is generated from. So general teaching progression for us is we start with a mid-thigh pull, we go to a counter movement shrug, we do a pull from the knee so we can work on the transition phase, then we do a hang clean pull or hang snatch pull um, where we start at the mid thigh, um, do a counter movement down to the knee, transition back and then do a pull. And then from there, we can start to incorporate um, either more hang variations like the high pull or the jump shrug, or we can move down to the floor um, to, uh, to start working on the pull to the knee and then the uh, first pull, second pull, um, combination, first pull transition, second pull combination. So I like to say that we start from the middle. Uh, we've had success with that. 
Um, and as we're doing that, that's when we're incorporating kind of those catching drills to help individuals turn over the bar. Um, I found that to be successful primarily just because of the fact they, uh, the individuals are also going to be doing front squats and doing some overhead squats at that time. Um, so they're developing the necessary strength that we need them to if they um, are going to be using those catching variations later. And once we develop the ability to pull, um, we can start incorporating catching variations if they're ready for it. Uh, and again, as coaches, we just need to decide on an individual basis if they are ready for it uh, at that time. Uh, Christos, uh, in our team, some players come from the academies that learn how to weightlift and others don't. Would you try teaching or would you try to teach the players that don't weightlift, uh, even though in the first team setup, time is limited? That's a very, very good question. Um, I know that while I was over in the UK, I, um, I know that some of the big football clubs, um, you know, Man City, Liverpool, Manchester United, uh, Arsenal, et cetera, there, the development of the athletes is very unique to each academy. Um, and I know that some incorporate, you know, talking with Potty Roach who, with uh, Arsenal, they do a lot of weightlifting. Um, but as you mentioned, there's other individuals that don't do any. Um, because of the limited time, what I would advise is that um, you're probably going to want to use the biggest bang for your buck at the time. Now, that being said, that may be incorporating some of the um, easier to learn weightlifting movements, like your mid thigh pull, like your counter movement shrug and maybe jump shrug, that type of thing. Um, but at the same time, um, you may, uh, let's put it this way, individuals in the academy, um, in, in academies in general, um, developing good movement patterns such as squatting, um, such as landing mechanics and things like that, that's going to go a really long way, but then we can start to sprinkle in more weightlifting movements uh, with those individuals. Um, I know Potty is a, is a big proponent of it, um, as, as am I, um, but again, it's about the biggest bang for your buck. So, um, But it, incorporating things like jumping variations, your hex bar jumps, uh, jump squats, that may be good for the time being until they develop the movement patterns that they can use and uh, use something a bit more complex. Uh, hang clean step up. Um, to be honest, I've never used it. Um, I, I'm, <laughs> I've never used it. I've seen videos of individuals trying to do this. Um, I just don't, I don't necessarily see the transfer as much. Um, this is just my opinion, my perspective. Um, it's not to say that it can't be a useful exercise. It's just not something that I would incorporate personally. Um, I think I'd rather do a step up isolated by itself, uh, rather than trying to, um, make it more complex by incorporating a, an already complex movement with a, uh, a weightlifting variation. So again, um, I'm not saying don't use it, but, um, that is, uh, if you, if you choose to use it, I just uh, emphasize safety and that's with everything. Um, what is your suggestion for periodization of endurance athletes? Which, uh, which things should be um, different in each phase classification according to what you mentioned about the phases? Well, um, good question. Um, little, little, uh, uh, little different from our, from our discussion, which is absolutely fine. Um, do I think uh, endurance athletes can perform weightlifting movements? Yes, I actually know a number of them that are really good at performing weightlifting movements. Um, very basic ones. I'm not asking them to do full snatches or anything like that. Um, however, what I would say is that um, I would say that it's important to make sure that you are maximizing the um, the goals of the training phase. Generally speaking. Endurance athletes need to focus primarily on uh, developing strength. Now, before people say, well, you're going to have them one RM, no, I'm not. Developing strength, strength um, as a definition, the way we define it, is the ability to produce force. Um, and that has uh, both a magnitude and a rate. So 
I'm focused on these athletes. I don't really go into a higher volume phase with them. Uh, we generally focus on um, general strength with these athletes, but also uh, depending on their distance that they're covering. Um, if you think about something like an 800, an 800 has become a really, really long sprint with the world record being a minute 40, which is insane to think about. Um, that being said, uh, to incorporating some of these movements with the, um, with the endurance athletes can certainly be beneficial. Um, it's just a matter, again, of what your goals are and what you're trying to get out of the athletes at that given time. Um, periodization, again, is different from programming. How I would set this up is we're just making sure that we're trying to um, maximize their adaptations uh, near their, uh, where, when they need to peak, essentially. Uh, just understand that individuals that are, um, that are going to be more strength power, for lack of a better term, in terms of endurance athletes need more of these type or may need more of these types of movements to get that force component, that rate of force development. Individuals who are more strength endurance oriented, um, or I should say muscle endurance oriented, where they have longer events like your, um, your 5,000, 10,000. It's not to say you can't incorporate these movements, but you're probably going to be doing them um, with uh, slightly higher volumes, because at that point we're talking about repeated force production and their ability to produce force um, over a longer period of time. So I think with that, um, I hope that answered your question. If anyone else has any other questions, you can type them into the Q&A or into the chat. I've been looking at both, but um, I think I cleared everything out right now, Andrew. Yeah, I think. Uh... I think we've got quite a few through quite a few questions there, Tim. So uh, yeah, thank you for for going through all those. I know we've we've probably gone over time a little bit, but it's um, it's a, you know it's a great topic, and I think S and C coaches love love this type of stuff. So this has been this has been really great, Tim. Thank you so much for this. No, not a problem. I appreciate it. And this is stuff I could talk talk about all day. I see a couple of my students on here and they know that. So they're probably <laughs> like, oh, just stop already. <laughs> yeah, and we'll, um, we'll have the recording uh, up for members um, within the next week or so. So there'll probably be lots more people who get a chance to see this, which is great. And I know you put your your email and, and links to social media and things on there. So it, it seems like you're pretty open to to receiving those, you know, questions and everything else, which, which will be great. Yeah, feel free, anybody, if you uh, if you have questions that you didn't want to ask now, or, or if you happen to think of something afterwards, please feel free to shoot me an email or a message on, uh, on social media, um, usually on both Twitter and Instagram fairly regularly. Um, with email, you know, I'll, I'll, I will certainly get back to you when I can. Um, but obviously, as the school year starts to ramp up here pretty soon, uh, it gets busy. So just uh, ask for a little leniency in terms of time there, but I'll do my best to get back to everyone who has a question. Great, and then thank you everyone for, for joining us today. Um, and hopefully you'll, you'll all be able to join us at the, the conference coming up in a few weeks, which, which Tim will be talking it again, which we look forward to um, in a few weeks time. So um, yeah, thanks again, everyone. And thanks, thanks Tim. Um, thank you. Thank you.